so now you got a good idea about water and uh, management of water from large scale to small scale and also to small scale to large scale here in this class i would like to introduce about why we need this type of management and how we can do this type of management in a technical way so this is an introduction about what are our systems modeling techniques as our previous speaker has talked about water is the crucial element for human being next to the air so practically we can live without air for only 29 days after that we may have to go out of this country world and not only that the status of a country or the socio economic development of the country is based upon the available water resources that is why professor dr or uh, previous prime minister told that uh, the large dams are the temples of modern india right they are, they are the thing which gives us pure this gives the purity right and they are the key element in the socio economic development of our country what is the problem in that there is rain is occurring copiously everybody knows that there is copious amount of water everybody hears everywhere flooding 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 then what is the problem in that the problems are like this the water demand is increasing day by day mainly due to three reasons one is extensive and intensive agriculture as professor eldo said 83% or 85% of available water is being utilized for irrigation by various methods and also there are two ways how we use this water one is for extensive and another one is for intensive agriculture and this increases the water requirement and second one is the power production and the third one is the municipal and industrial use this also increasing day by day however i have listed this in reverse order world bank list industrial and municipal demand as the first priority second priority is for irrigation and third priority is for water production however the availability of water this is demand we know that water is increasing day by day its demand however even though we hear many places flooding 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 and there are some places where there is a severe drought and in some places where we see that there is no water availability and uh, we can say that technically the water availability over a period of time in a space is fixed we may wonder how there are two variations in water availability one is spatial variation another one is temporal variation spatial variation means availability over a period over the space for example in india at a given time we have variations in availability of water from rajasthan to india rajasthan to chennai in a particular place for example in mumbai itself we have variation in availability from one time to another time so if i consider a period of time what we call technically as hydrological cycle time period water takes its own path to move from one process to another process and nobody knows what is the time period taken by a single water particle it will travel all the processes and reach again its own path that is one cycle and if we are able to assess this time period then we can manage the water availability to some extent and we are trying to find out this length of the path and that is where our people are working what is the data length we need for modeling whether it is 5 years 10 years 15 years 20 years 30 years 60 years do not fight because that is the period where we have various spatial and temporal availability but this repeats the cycle repeats and what is this time period no need to fight our people have given this is a constant over a period of time so i could not open this two countries one is india another one is china which gave this time period india gave the time period as 60 years that means we know that each year is named one name and this name repeats once in 60 years and chinese takes 12 years is the longest time period for hydrological cycle and for them the hydrological cycle repeats once in 12 years and their names are given by animal names and for them this year is pig years right so this is the availability of within this 12 year 12 period technically this 12 years is the jubilant 
time period or it is the time period taken by the Jupiter to cross over the sun. So that is the water availability and second one is the spatial and temporal variation, availability of water over the space and time and this is physical processes, we cannot do anything with that, alter this spatial and temporal availability but we can overcome this variations by judicial use and efficient and effective utilization. How we can do that? That is where our technical comes into the matter. We can construct large, medium and small reservoirs. But these reservoirs, once it is constructed, it will never give us the management. We need to operate these reservoirs in an effective way. That is where we use these soft computing techniques or water resources modeling techniques. And before going into these different modeling techniques, I would like to introduce a SWOT analysis of water resources. Until now, even today, water industry is never considered as a large scale industry. And we never thought that water is also an industry. Because we do this SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is strength, weakness, opportunities and threats. Now under QIP uh, TechIP program, we have to do individual SWOT analysis for each and every faculty in our engineering colleges. That is what AICT gives. So I would like to do a SWOT analysis for water resources. Consider this also as an industry. What is its strength, weakness and opportunities, particularly for our Indian country? We have a great strength, which other countries doesn't have. India is gifted with large number of rivers. Not only that, Professor Elda has taken, we have gifted with large quantity of water also. Then where does our weakness lies? There are four or five places where our weakness are there. First one is spatial and temporal variations, which is uncorrectable. Like uh, the rainfall at Sirabunji is in the order of 11,000 mm, whereas at Jail Samir it is, in Rajasthan it is only 215 mm per year. This is the spatial variation. Out of this 410 to the power of meter cube or 400 kilometer cube, only 69 kilometer cube is in utilizable form or we can directly use. 50 percent is, we cannot even see the quantity of water. And secondly, whatever the large quantity of reservoirs, there are more than 4,000, 5,000 large dams in India. Still, the water stored in these dams is insufficient to meet our demand. That is the weakness. And also the monsoon failures or excess rainfall is a failure of entire season. Right? Then second weakness is pollution of the existing resources. And uh, this only awareness among the users uh, can revert back this pollution. Right? The next thing is whatever the reservoirs we have constructed, at present they are operated based upon thumb rule or based upon experience. There is no technical way how these dams has to be managed. If you see any reservoir, all the reservoir operating policies are formulated when they are constructed. They have not been updated regularly based upon the experience gained. Because these reservoirs, it's not possible to construct large reservoirs nowadays. Somebody was asking, we have to go in from lower scale to large scale rather than from large scale to lower scale. Nowadays, we have been evolving ourselves superior, superior by technology, by having, we can construct a very big dam. Technically, it is possible. There are some other issues like sociological problem, environmental impact assessment problems which restrict us in constructing this large size reservoirs in India. And uh, topography also does not allow us in India to construct large dams. In Ganges, Brahmaputra, everybody says that this much quantity of water goes to sea from Ganges, from Godavari. Technically, it is not possible to construct very large dams to store this water which are going to the oceans. Because the avail water availability at the place where water can be stored has already been exploited. We can say 95 percent of surface water, possible surface water has been stored in large dams and reservoirs. So next one is improp improper understanding of the hydrological phenomena. Even today we have not understood the hydrological cycle or hydrology and its interaction from one process to another process. We pose that as if we have understood and try to evaluate it in terms of mathematical equations and we say that it works for 100 percent, 200 percent. But the same equation, same solution, if I apply it in some other place, it will never work. 
That means whatever we have understood is of limited knowledge and limited space of the given time. Right? And uh, next resource is the aquifer. In our, uh, we have large aquifers, but unfortunately, uh, these aquifers are either <coughs> overdeveloped or underdeveloped. That means either we have salinity problem or we have drought problem. Uh, we might have heard that Rajasthan is suffering from uh, water scarcity, but if you go around this Indira Gandhi Canal, we have salinity problem, right? Because of uh, over irrigation and improper drainage arrangements. These are all some of the weaknesses in our water resources in India. And what is the opportunities for us to improve using our technological? If large scale reservoirs are not possible, there is possibility of constructing small reservoirs or medium reservoirs or rainwater harvesting at household. And we can use better management for managing our aquifers. And we can operate the reservoirs optimally for allocating it for various users. By that we can maximize the economic returns. Then we can augment the sources, that is desalinization, conjunctive use, or we can use for reuse and recycling in industries, or we can go for on-farm developmental works, or we can create awareness among the people not to pollute the available resources. Right? So these are all some of the opportunities where we can improve our strength. And there are certain places where we are unable to make the weak into a strength that is called threats. This is the first one is large spatial and temporal variation. We cannot do anything. Only thing is we can distribute this spatial and temporal variation by interbasin transfers. And second threat is paving of good aquifers. Unfortunately, if you see the metropolitan cities are very large cities, they are located in good aquifers. And for example, Chennai, Mumbai, Kolkata, Delhi, they are having very good aquifers. Unfortunately, we are paving it. And we are over exploiting this by and thereby we are getting into saline water intrusion. Once saline water intrusion occurred and once we paved, there is no possibility of recharging and re retrieving it back to the original condition. That is the threats. It's not possible to get back my Chennai to the old status or Mumbai to the old status of unpaved condition. So that is one threat. Second one is this demand. Demand is increasing it's day by day, hour by hour, it is increasing due to increase in population. Second one is the larger threat is from sociological problems. We cannot even openly say that we are going to construct a large dam in a place. The first problem we will face is the sociological problems. Right? Even the largest dam which has been constructed in China, it is also facing a sociological problems, three Gargas dams. <coughs> then the next one is implementation of best policies which we have derived through our techniques. Changing the reservoir operating policy in a reservoir is not that much easy. Right? You have to convince from chief engineer to the person who is operating the gate. That's not an easy task. And then very important is the irreversible pollution made. For example, many rivers which is passing through the cities, people know from Nandia, Nashik, how they are seeing the Godavari, right? how they are seeing the Krishna. That they are all black in color within the city reach or you see the Mithi river or Kuom river or whatever the Hooghly which is passing through the metropolitan cities. They are all black in color. That pollution, is it possible to revert it back? We have to work hard like how they have reverted back the Thames. Thames was also once upon a time it was like that. But so much of money, so much of courage is, is required to reverse back this pollution. But in our case, this is irreversible, the pollution which has been made. And sometimes the awareness program which we broadcast may backfire us. These are all some of the threats on water resources. But still to manage our water resources, we need to study how to manage this. So there are so many management techniques available. One of the best management techniques people used to say is that um, somehow I managed. Right? That, that's a common management technique people used to adopt to manage a particular problem. If you, if you don't know how you have managed, we say that somehow I managed. And sometimes this is the best management policy also. 
and in water resources also we are doing only management like that. But what we need is a systematic study. That means if something goes wrong, you have to correct only that particular place where it went wrong. You don't need to go through the exercise from first to last. That's called systematic study. And there should this systematic study should include groundwater also as one of the resources. And uh, for that we need uh, groundwater availability, groundwater assessments. Right? So thus we need uh, a technical background to manage our resources. Then what is the actual problem as a water resources technical person we are looking at? Suppose if I want to operate a reservoir or if I want to model a water resources basin. What is What are all the problems we may encounter when we go for this water resource planning? The first one is inadequate understanding of the system. Because a problem and a solution which worked better for a basin or a reservoir will never work better for another place. So you have to understand, even though you are an expert in water resources, if you are appointed to solve your problem, first thing is we have to accept that we don't know anything about the system. Start from the scratch. Understand the physical system first. Many people solve the problems without understanding the problems. Right? So many works, watch, what we are doing as research and consultancy is inadequate understanding of the system. For example, people have designed this interception and diversion storages in rivers of Godavari and Krishna. They have designed a pumping system and a pipeline system and they have used their own alignment. When we went there to the actual field, it's not possible to do that in that alignment. That means it's an inadequate understanding of the system. If I want to change that alignment, either I have to redesign or I have to spend a lot of money to correct that problem. So this inadequate understanding should be violated first. We have to understand the system to solve any solution. Second one is the response of the system for a given input is not known. Even today, the same rainfall, we have some runoff in one time period. The same rainfall, we have different runoff in the same time period. For example, if it is June 10th in 1986, if it is 30 centimeter rainfall, I have a runoff of, let us say, 20 centimeter in terms of depth. If it is on 1987, same 30 centimeter rainfall, I never have the same 20 centimeter as the runoff. It's the same time period but different years. Quantity is also same. Variation in the time is also same. That means the response of the system for the given input is not same. That is why people say that the probability of nature is almost zero. Nature will never repeat the thing once again. Right? Then the next important problem is heterogeneity of the crops. That means most of the reservoirs in India are designed for either wet crop or dry crop. But if you go for an uh, irrigation area, your reservoir will have n number of crops. And all the crops we cannot account when I model for a reservoir operating policy. We consider only the major crops. And uh, next one is the crop plants are fixed. Either it is Rabi or Karif or Swarna Jayanti or depends upon the place. Kar, Pishanam, Sornavari, Taladi. See, these crop periods are fixed in a particular basin. Whether there is water in the reservoir or not, the farmer will start the cultivation during that time periods. So, the crop plants are fixed. Secondly, the reservoir releases. It is also fixed. The very important technical mistakes we do in construction of reservoir is the keeping the sill levels of canals at different levels. Right? Particularly, we say that high level canal. Right? We say that uh, there is so much quantity of water is going as the surplus. So we want to utilize this surplus water through high level canal. So the high level canal means it will have the sill level very nearer to the surplus level. So when there is a surplus water only, it, the water will be receiving in the high level canal. Even when there is a surplus, when we are drawing the water through the regular canal, the water level drops suddenly. So even though there is quantity of water, you may not receive water in your high level canal. And mathematically, it is not possible to model these different levels in the canals. But still, we are trying to do this through parametric programming, but not achieve to that particular <coughs> level. And next one is shifting of dry crop to wet crops. That means if we design a reservoir, 
its capacity based upon assuming certain crop, dry crop and find its, keep it demand or keep it capacity fixed. Suppose if I change the type of crop in the command area, my demand has increased enormously. Then even though I have a water in the reservoir, I cannot release the required quantity of water. My parameters, canal carrying capacity is fixed. I cannot release more than the canal carrying capacity. So these are all some of the problems um, which we have to address or which we are trying to address through mathematical programs. And the very important is that study is called systematic study. I think you are all researchers and you have, have an exposure about systematic study. I given a simple example of what is systematic study. Right? If I want to study 10th standard, I have to start from 1st standard, 2nd standard, 3rd, 5th. So that is called a systematic study. So that systematic study can be done through a systems approach. Uh, so what is systems approach? We say that our body is a system. Right? A car is a system. So a system contains various components. Right? We have various components. We have hand, we have head, we have artillery, we have legs, we have nervous system. So we have various subsystems. So these components or this subsystem, they will work individually. Or they may interact or may not interact with the other subsystem. They have individual goals. But all are working for a common goal. And that is, we call it as a system. And uh, physically, if there is a system, if you give an input, you will get an output. Then only we call it as a system. And in water resources, there are three different studies through the systems approach. First one is system design. Second one is system analysis. And third one is system synthesis. System design is we are going to create a system. It means I am going to design a water resources project. I am going to design a dam, I am going to design the canal carrying capacity, I am going to fix the command area, I am going to fix the type of crop, what is the area of the crop, power production, everything. We call that as a system design. We are creating the components. System analysis is, here already the creation has been done. We are going to operate that system. We are going to see the interaction between one component to the other component. And system synthesis is fine tuning. While in the operating itself, if you achieve 90%, if I do system synthesis, I can achieve 99% efficiency. Right? So these are all the three different systematic studies we can go ahead. Then if this is a systematic study, why I need this systematic study in water resources? If our problem falls or says yes to any one of these five questions, then I need a systematic study. If my system is large and complex, for a complex system it need not to be a large. Even a small system can also be a complex system. Then I need a systematic study. Right? Or if a system involves or necessitate knowledge from many disciplines. Right? We know that water resources is a large system and a complex system. And water resource requires knowledge from various disciplines. We need hydrologists, we need irrigation engineers, we need structural engineers, we need sociologists, we need economists, right? We need uh, various knowledges from sociological, that's very important. Then agricultural, crop management, crop production engineers. So we need knowledge from various subjects. Then only we can operate our system. In such problems, we need a systems approach. Or if the objective need to be quantified in terms of mathematical terms or logical terms, right? then we need a systematic study. We can quantify our water resources in terms of mathematical, monetary benefits, non-monetary benefits or logical terms. Then we need a systematic study. Then if one or more variables involve uncertainty, there also we need a systems approach. For example, if it is a factory, I know if I give this much of input, the output is fixed. It's a deterministic problem. Whereas in water resources, large number of variables involve uncertainty. Rainfall, inflow into the reservoir. There are so many uncertainties. In such problem to solve, I need a systematic study. 
and uh, very important why we need even if there is no for all this problems if your problem has many alternative viable solutions then also i need a systematic study i think only water resource is the problem where it will have a alternative viable solution even water resource we can say no 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 for the first four but the last one if i give a reservoir for one person he will manage it in a better way than any other person or if i give the same problem to another person he can manage it in better way than any other person so a same problem will have multi alternative solutions then also i need a systematic study okay i accept that if i want to go for a systematic study what are all the steps right? as a uh, modeler or a water resources modeler i want to do a model then what are all the steps if the steps are fixed i can reach the goal if my steps are not fixed i cannot reach the goal so what are all the steps there are five important steps in water resources systems analysis first one is definition of system and objectives if our objectives are clear 50% of our problem is solved right so that's why in research also we say that identify your objectives identify your topic identify your system 50% of the problem is solved what is that we have to identify what is the components and what is our boundaries then identify the decision makers then quantify your objectives that's the first step second step is now you model your system using various mathematical modeling techniques that means find out what is the relationship between your input and output by different modeling techniques then not only that get the solution for the model many water resource problem the solutions are alternative we get n number of viable solution which is the best solution to be implemented in the field get the solution then select the best solution then give it to the policy makers so the policy maker will select a particular solution and they will implement in the field so our study does not stop at that point you have to study the performance of our decision that is called performance analysis or performance of the solution how it is working in our field whether our assumptions are correct whether the parameters what we have assumed is working nicely so once we do this performance analysis if whatever we gave the solution and actual field it is 90% then we are becoming a very good modeler suppose if it is not working then what you have to do is that is the feedback for our first step then redo the modeling get the better solutions so these are all the five important steps that we have to pass it on to a water resources system analysis and i can say as a starting people the first and important for us is the second step how to develop a mathematical model that is where the core research is working so that means we say that models right the models we know this is a characteristic representation of a prototype right it may be a scaled up model or scaled down model for example in our laboratory hydraulics iit bombay we have done various number of physical models they are all scaled down that means the prototype will be of large size we will be scaling down to 1 is to 10 or 1 is to 15 or 1 is to 5 so the model will be smaller prototype will be larger whereas in chemistry or in atoms the model will be of scale up the our prototype will be smaller model will be a very big one right so we in water resources always we have this scale down models and the main purpose is to select the component important components and also to find out the relationship hydraulic hydrologic structural versus the hydrological relationships that is the main objective of this model studies there are four important model studies in water resources first one is iconic models second is physical analog and mathematical models i think we know what is iconic model an iconic model is a model which represents only the prototype we cannot conduct any experiments on iconic model for example if i have a car car tie 
right? That is an iconic model. I cannot conduct any experiment on this car and relate the result to my prototype. That models we call it as iconic models. Then we have this physical models. Physical models are representation of prototype in same medium or same entity. We can conduct the experiments on these models and relate the results to our prototype. This may be based upon various similitudes, Reynolds similitude, Weber similitude, Fruits similitude, depending upon the hydraulic and hydrologic conditions. What we do in hydraulic is either Fruits similitude or Reynolds similitude. Then third one is analog models. There are certain experiments, certain prototype problems which we cannot do it in physical model studies. For example, if I want to study the seepage analysis below an earthen dam, even if I construct a small scale, I cannot visualize how this water is moving below my earthen dam. In such places, we do this analog model. That means conduct the experiment in some other entity. There in analog model, I do the flow of current in water and I relate this flow net of flow of current in water to the flow net of seepage analysis. That is called analog models. Then the last one is mathematical models. This has been evolved. I can say this mathematical model is the soft computing techniques. And after invention of computers, after invention of these laptops, everything, all other three models have become absolute. We are not going in for this type of models. Only large scale models we go in for physical or analog models. Nowadays for small problems, operational problems, planning problems, we do only mathematical models. Mathematical models, we express the relationship between input and output in terms of mathematical equations. And I can classify the mathematical models in water resources as two broad areas. First one is hydrological models, another one is water resources models. So this is an example for a physical model study, a surplus over a year. This is a surplus over a spillway. And uh, this is how to study the ski jump formation. These are all the models carried out at CWPRS Pune. The courtesy is to them. These are also model study of discharge over a spillway. And this is dam break analysis can also be done by physical model studies. Wherever it is not possible to express the relationship between input and output, there only we are going in for this type of physical model studies nowadays. For example, large pumping schemes, which is an inverse of a dam. We don't have mathematical models to represent the hydrology as well as hydraulics. There we are going in for physical model studies. Right? So I have <coughs> listed out what are all the important models in hydrology. See, there are various types of models in hydrology. Uh, they are all classified into three types. First one is empirical models, which are derived for site-specific input and output. Second type of models are physical models, which are based upon the physical processes. And these physical processes, the parameters of expressing these physical processes are also based upon empirical approach. So we need some parameter estimation in physical models. Then the last and very important and complicated models are the conceptual models, which is based upon the physics of each and every process. For example, Nash model, linear reservoir model in unit instantaneous unit of derivation is a good example for conceptual models. Deriving rainfall runoff relationship by incorporating evaporation, interception, <coughs> uh, various other uh, evapotranspiration, they comes under physical models. Right? Simple Rice formula, Dickens formula, they are all examples for empirical models. And these models, depending upon how we give the input, can be classified into four categories that depends upon the input. First one is deterministic, probabilistic, stochastic and fuzzy. Deterministic means the input is clearly defined as a number. All are numbers only. They are tagged with some suffix. In deterministic, the number is very clear. If you say the input of inflow is 50 million meter cube, then that is a deterministic model. Suppose if I tag this input deterministic value with a problem or with a probability 
the probability of occurrence of 50 million meter cube is 0.75 then such types of models are called probabilistic model if I tag the probability with time then we call that as stochastic model if I say the probability of inflow of 50 million meter cube in June month is 0.75 so it is same number same probability with time then we call that as stochastic models instead of saying a single number if I say a range or if I say it in a linguistic form if you say the inflow is 40 to 60 million meter cube or the inflow is high then I call such type of modeling as fuzzy modeling so this is based upon the values then based upon the time series data all water resource data are time series data based upon this we can classify the models as stationary models or non-stationary models uh, you know that all ARIMA model, ARMA model uh, they are all stationary models then based upon the data it can be a lumped model or distributed models then based upon the relationship between input and output it can be linear or non-linear models then the based upon the time step in my model in what condition I want to simulate I want to find out the rainfall of today tomorrow day after tomorrow or I may have to find out the rainfall of this month next month then my time step is day this is month so this is a time step in my model at what time steps I am estimating the time uh, the processes or it may be an event based that means in time based models my time interval is fixed for each and every fixed time interval I simulate the basin whereas in event based my time is not fixed suppose if I want to model the flood studies then I don't look in for a fixed time interval the flood we are looking only for the events to occur so here the events are fixed time intervals are variable whereas in time based model time is fixed events are variable then we may model a single variate or multivariate single variate means just inflow into one single reservoir that is a single variate if I try to model inflow into five reservoirs at a particular time period then that is a multivariate y is equal to mx plus c that is a single variate y is equal to m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus m3 x3 plus c that is a multivariate I am trying to model various parameters or various variables at a given time then based upon the site it may be a single site or multi site so these are all the models the unfortunate condition or the better thing is the models need not be of any one category all the research done are only combination of models the uh, remaining I said if you find out what is your objectives 50 percent of your problem is solved if you have selected the correct model your remaining 25 percent of the problem is solved because there is no single model available to solve all the problems so I have to combine the models to solve my problem depending upon the site condition so I have just given a simple example there are I have taken only conceptual models stochastic conceptual models then stochastic empirical models or it may be a deterministic conceptual or deterministic empirical if I consider stochastic it may be stationary or non-stationary or it may be linear non-linear or it may be lump or distributed so there is a combination of different models together in a single model depending upon my type of data site and location or the properties of my time series data that is in hydrology whereas in water resources which is mostly used for planning and operation we have two broad classification that is called optimization and simulation the optimization models they are called prescriptive models that means the optimization model will give you the best solution that is why if we have some illness we go to a doctor he gives a prescription that means for this problem this is the best solution that is called optimization models whereas simulation models are mostly used for planning for a same input we generate alternative scenarios and that is called simulation models they are called descriptive models right 
So these are all the various models in water resources. Uh, again, I have listed this based upon the processes and different model types. Again, we, the two broad classification is optimization and uh, simulation. Again, based upon the values, it is deterministic, probabilistic, stochastic, and fuzzy. And uh, very important here is the last point that is based upon the solution algorithm. Right? We have linear and nonlinear. Right? So nowadays we represent only the nonlinear model because in earlier days people used to work lot on these linear models. But in reality, the relationship between input and output is not linear. So we are working mainly on nonlinear models. The solution algorithms which we have listed, if you solve this by manually, it is not possible to solve. Right? There we apply our softwares, there we apply our computers and that is why we call this as soft computing techniques. I can say even linear programming in water resources is a soft computing technique. Because if I consider a large reservoir with three canals and with 20 crops in each canal, if I do a monthly model, then I will end up with 144 or 186 constraint with 150 variables. I cannot solve a matrix of 144 by 122 by hand. I need a computer. It is not possible manually. Even though we are superior, our brains are superior than computers, it is not possible, physically possible to solve that. In such places, we use these computers. That is why still I classify linear programming is also a soft computing technique in water resources because the system is large. The very important techniques I have listed here, linear programming, integer programming, mixed integer, transportation assignment, they are all linear programs or then nonlinear programming are dynamic goal programming, genetic algorithm, genetic programming, particle swarm algorithm, ANN, they are all classified under nonlinear programming. What is that we need in water resources systems modeling? We need two things, two mathematical equations. First one is objective function. That's either it may be a cost minimization or benefit maximization, technical objectives, then we need the constraints. These constraints are the boundaries where I can fit my objective function so that my objective function value is maximum. And these constraints may be of four types, physical, economic, economical, sociological as well as technical. So the solution here or my problem here is find out the maximum value for my objective function without violating the constraints. So physically solving these constraints is not possible. That is where we take the advantage of computers and we class, classify this as soft computing techniques. Linear programming will be defined as the relationship between input and output is linear. I think you are all well versed with this. this uh, good example for a classical linear programming model, right? So the advantage of linear programming is easy way of getting the solution and large number of softwares are easily available uh, in getting the solution. But it has three or four great advantages. One is the output is crisp. Either the solution is in the space or my variable is in the solution space or not my values will have either a 0 or 1, right? Then the result, the result may be in local optima, right? Then we may have some infeasible solutions. Lastly, very important is our real life problems are not linear problems, right? But even now today, people are using this linear programming to find out the optimal cropping pattern in a reservoir. These are all other forms of linear programming stochastic, chance constraint, integer, mixed integer, fuzzy logic. I think we can go this in detail in later. The next important type of modeling is nonlinear programming. I have a nonlinear relationship between input and output either in the objective function or in the constraint or both. Still I classify that model as a nonlinear programming model. Uh, depending upon how or where I have this nonlinearity, 
I have various solution algorithm. For example, Newton Raphson method is a, one of the method to get a solution roots for a nonlinear equation. So these are all some of the equations, and this is the widely used software for solving a nonlinear equations. Right? These are all other forms of NLP model, quadratic programming, geometric, separable, genetic algorithm, and genetic programs. The another important is dynamic programming model. This is the most important model we apply in water resources because only water resources requires a sequential decision. That means if I want to operate a reservoir, if I release the water on June, once it is released, it is irreversible. So my decision on July depends upon the release I took on June. So in such type of sequential decision making problems, dynamic programming is the best model. Unfortunately, many real life problems we cannot solve through this dynamic programming because of this curse of dimensionality. Even with the soft computing techniques, even though this dynamic programming gives best results to derive reservoir operating rules, I cannot solve because of curse of dimensionality. My computer will struck up because the matrix will go in terms of 1000 by 1000 or 2000 by 3000 like that. Right? So this dynamic programming is very important. There are four important dynamic programmings which we use in our water resources. One is optimal routing, particularly in pipe network analysis or sewage pumping, which is the optimal route through which my pipe network has to pass. Or it may be an optimal allocation within the canal reaches, what is the release for each and every sluice. Or it may be for a reservoir operating rule curves. Or it may be for capacity expansion. It means if I plan for a water supply for a city of 50 years, what, what should be the capacity for each and every step I have to increase? We will not construct all the capacity in the starting itself. So it depends upon the economics. I think uh, this simulation, I will take it in the next class. So that we will have some, because this is a different technique. Uh, next class I will take this simulation. If you have any solution, if you have any questions, you can ask the questions. Before that, this only introduction, I would like to introduce this slide. Morning we were talking about the status of water resources today. Right? Ninety percent of the countries in the world, there is inland water resources problem. Either non-availability, excess availability or internal sharing problem. Remaining ten percent of the country, they will have cross country problems we will be fighting with the next countries. Thus, if water is not managed technically efficient way, this WATER will become, this TE will go and we have to fight for the water. As a water resources managers, I ca we are all water resource managers because we have interest in water resources. We will be part of any one. Either we will shoot the problem or we'll, we will create the problem. Right? Both are good. If you create a problem, there will be somebody to solve it. Or if you are solving it, somebody is there to create the problem. Right? Thank you.